Chapter Seven of History of the World War by Francis March and Richard Beamish. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter Seven: The First Battle of the Marne. France and civilization were saved by Joffre and Foch at the Battle of the Marne in September 1914. Autocracy was destroyed by Foch at the Second Battle of the Marne in July 1918. This, in a nutshell, embraces the dramatic opening and closing episodes of the World War on the soil of France. Bracketed between these two glorious victories were the agonies of martyred France, the deaths and lifelong cripplings of millions of men, the uprooting of arrogant militarism, the liberation of captive nations. The first battle of the Marne was wholly a French operation. The British were close at hand, but had no share in the victory. Generals Galigny and Manouy, acting under instructions from Marshal Joffre, were driven by automobile to the headquarters of the British commander, Sir John French, in the village of Melun. They explained in detail General Joffre's plan of attack upon the advancing German army. An urgent request was made that the British army halt its retreat, face about, and attack the two corps of von Kluck's army then confronting the British. Simultaneously with this attack, General Manouy's forces were to fall upon the flank and rear guard of Van Kluck along the river Oak. This operation was planned for the next day, September 5th. Sir John French replied that he could not get his tired army in readiness for battle within 48 hours. This would delay the British attack in all probability until September 7th. Joffre's plan of battle, however, would admit of no delay. The case was urgent. There was grave danger of a union between the great forces headed by the crown prince and those under van Kluck. He resolved to go ahead without the British, and ordered Manouy to strike as had been planned. He fixed as an extreme limit for the movement of retreat, which was still going on, the line of bray sur seine nogent sur seine arcis sur aube vitre le francois and the region to the north of Bardeduc. This line might be reached if the troops were compelled to go back so far. They would attack before reaching it, as soon as there was a possibility of bringing about an offensive disposition, permitting the cooperation of the whole of the French forces. On September 5 it appeared that this desired situation existed. The first German army, carrying audacity to temerity, had continued its endeavor to envelop the French left, had crossed the Grand Morin, and had reached the region of Chauffre, to the south of Rabais and Esternay. It aimed then at cutting Joffre off from Paris, in order to begin the investment of the capital. The second army had its head on the line Champombert, Etogé, Berger, and Vertus. The third and fourth armies reached the chalon sur marne and bussy le repos The fifth army was advancing on one side, and the other from the Aragon, as far as triacourt les Alettes and Givacourt. The sixth and seventh armies were attacking more to the east. The French left army had been able to occupy the line Saison, Villa Saint Georges, and Courchamp. This was precisely the disposition which the general in chief had wished to see achieved. On the fourth, he decided to take advantage of it and ordered all the armies to hold themselves ready. He had taken from his right two new army corps, two divisions of infantry, and two divisions of cavalry which were distributed between his left and his centre. On the evening of the 5th, he addressed to all the commanders of armies a message ordering them to attack. The hour has come, he wrote, to advance at all costs, and to die where you stand rather than give way. If one examines the map, it will be seen that by his inflection toward Mew and Coulomiers, General von Kluck was exposing his right to the offensive action of the French left. This is the starting point of the victory of the Marne. On the evening of September 5th, the French left army had reached the front, Penchon sans soufflet vert. On the 6th and 7th, it continued its attacks vigorously, with the Oche as objective. On the evening of the 7th, it was some kilometers from the Oche, on the front, Chambray, Marcelli, Lissois, Acy and Moutin. On the 8th, the Germans, who had in great haste reinforced their right by bringing their second and fourth army corps back to the north, obtained some successes by attacks of extreme violence. But in spite of this pressure the French held their ground. In a brilliant action they took three standards, 
and being reinforced prepared a new attack for the tenth at the moment that this attack was about to begin the enemy was already in retreat toward the north the attack became a pursuit and on the twelfth the french established themselves on the aisne why did the german forces which were confronting the french and on the evening before attacking so furiously retreat on the morning of the tenth because in bringing back on the sixth several army corps from the south to the north to face the french left the enemy had exposed his left to the attacks of the now rested british who had immediately faced around toward the north and to those of the french armies which were prolonging the english lines to the right this is what the french command had sought to bring about this is what happened on september eighth and allowed the development and rehabilitation which it was to effect on the sixth the british army set out from the line rosilani and that evening reached the southward bank of the grand marin on the seventh and eighth it continued its march and on the ninth had debouched to the north of the marne below chateau thierry the town that was to become famous for the american stand in nineteen eighteen taking in flank the german forces which on that day were opposing on the urk the french left army then it was that these forces began to retreat while the british army going in pursuit and capturing seven guns and many prisoners reached the aisne between Soissons and longueval the role of the french army which was operating to the right of the british army was threefold it had to support the british attacking on its left it had on its right to support the centre which from september seventh had been subjected to a german attack of great violence finally its mission was to throw back the three active army corps and the reserve corps which faced it on the seventh it made a leap forward and on the following days reached and crossed the marne seizing after desperate fighting guns howitzers mitrailleuses and a million cartridges on the twelfth it established itself on the north edge of the montagne de rheim in contact with the french centre which for its part had just forced the enemy to retreat in haste the french centre consisted of a new army created on august twenty ninth and of one of those which at the beginning of the campaign had been engaged in belgian luxembourg the first had retreated on august twenty ninth to september fifth from the aisne to the north of the marne and occupied the general front saison mele the second more to the east had drawn back to the south of the line humbaville chateau bouchamp biencourt blemes marupt le montoy the enemy in view of his right being arrested and the defeat of his enveloping movement made a desperate effort from the seventh to the nineteenth to pierce the french centre to the west and to the east of fier champonnais on the eighth he succeeded in forcing back the right of the new french army which retired as far as gorangeson on the ninth at six o'clock in the morning there was a further retreat to the south of that village while on the left the other army corps had also to go back to the line alamont conlater despite this retreat general foch commanding the army of the centre ordered a general offensive for the same day with the morocco division whose behaviour was heroic he met a furious assault of the germans on his left toward the marshes of sangon then with the divisions which had just victoriously overcome the attacks of the enemy to the north of saison and with the whole of his left army corps he made a flanking attack in the evening of the ninth upon the german forces and notably the guard which had thrown back his right army corps the enemy taken by surprise by this bold manoeuvre did not resist and beat a hasty retreat this marked foch as the most daring and brilliant strategist of the war on the eleventh the french crossed the marne between tours sur marne and sarre driving the germans in front of them in disorder on the twelfth they were in contact with the enemy to the north of the champ de chelons the reserve army of the centre acting on the right of the one just referred to had been entrusted with the mission during the seventh eighth and ninth of disengaging its neighbour and it was only on the tenth that being reinforced by an army corps from the east it was able to make its action effectively felt on the eleventh the germans retired but perceiving their danger they fought desperately with enormous expenditure of projectiles behind strong entrenchments on the twelfth the result had none the less been attained 
and the two French center armies were solidly established on the ground gained. To the right of these two armies were three others. They had orders to cover themselves to the north and to debauch toward the west on the flank of the enemy, which was operating to the west of Ergon. But a wide interval in which the Germans were in force separated them from the French center. The attack took place, nevertheless, with very brilliant success for the French artillery, which destroyed eleven batteries of the 16th German Army Corps. On the 10th instant, the 8th and 15th German Army Corps counterattacked, but were repulsed. On the 11th, French progress continued with new successes, and on the 12th, the French were able to face round toward the north in expectation of the near and inevitable retreat of the enemy, which, in fact, took place from the 13th. The withdrawal of the mass of the German force involved also that of the left. From the 12th onward, the forces of the enemy operating between Nancy and Vosges retreated in a hurry before the two French armies of the east, which immediately occupied the positions that the enemy had evacuated. The offensive of the French right had thus prepared and consolidated in the most useful way the results secured by the left and center. Such was this seven days battle, in which more than two millions of men were engaged. Each army gained ground step by step, opening the road to its neighbor, supported at once by it, taking in flank the adversary which the day before it had attacked in front, the efforts of one articulating closely with those of the other, a perfect unity of intention and method animating the supreme command. To give this victory all its meaning, it is necessary to add that it was gained by troops, which for two weeks had been retreating, and which, when the order for the offensive was given, were found to be as ardent as on the first day. It has also to be said that these troops had to meet the whole German army. Under their pressure, the German retreat, at certain times, had the appearance of a rout. In spite of the fatigue of the poilu, in spite of the power of the German heavy artillery, the French took colors, guns, miltreluses, shells, and thousands of prisoners. One German corps lost almost the whole of its artillery. In that great battle, the spectacular rush of General Galanese army defending Paris was one of the dramatic surprises that decided the issue. In that stroke, Galigny sent his entire force forty miles to attack the right wing of the German army. In this gigantic maneuver every motor car in Paris was utilized, and the flying force of Galigny became the army in taxicabs, a name that will live as long as France exists. General Clergerie, chief of staff to Galigny, told the story for posterity. He said, From August 26, 1914, the German armies had been descending upon Paris by forced marches. On September 1st, they were only three days' march from the advanced line of the entrenched camp, which the garrison were laboring desperately to put into condition for defense. It was necessary to cover with trenches a circuit of 110 miles, install siege guns, assure the coming of supplies for them over narrow-gauge railways, assemble the food and provisions of all kinds necessary for a city of four million inhabitants. But on September 3rd, the intelligence service, which was working perfectly, stated, about the middle of the day, that the German columns, after heading straight for Paris, were swerving toward the southeast and seemed to wish to avoid the fortified camp. General Galigny and I then had one of those long conferences which denoted grave events. They usually lasted from two to five minutes at most. The fact is that the military government of Paris did little talking. It acted. The conference reached this conclusion. If they do not come to us, we will go to them with all the force we can muster. Nothing remained but to make the necessary preparations. The first thing to do was not to give the alarm to the enemy. General Manwi's army immediately received orders to lie low and avoid any engagement that was not absolutely necessary. Then care was taken to reinforce it by every means. All was ready at the designated time. On the night of September 3rd, knowing that the enemy would have to leave only a rear guard on one bank of the Och, General Galigny and General Clegory decided to march against that rear guard, to drive it back with all the weight of Monwy's army, to cut the enemy's communications, and take full advantage of his hazardous situation. Immediately the following order was addressed to General Monwy. 
because of the movement of the german armies which seem to be slipping in before our front to the southeast i intend to send your army to attack them in the flank that is to say in an easterly direction i will indicate your line of march as soon as i learn that of the british army but make your arrangements now so that your troops shall be ready to march this afternoon and to begin a general movement east of the entrenched camp to-morrow at ten in the morning a consultation was held between generals galani clegary and monwy and the details of the plan of operations were immediately decided general joffre gave permission to attack and announced that he himself would take the offensive on the sixth on the fifth at noon the army from paris fired the first shot the battle of the Och, a preface to the marne had begun general clegary then told what a precious purveyor of information he had found in general van der marwitz cavalry commander of the first german army who made intemperate use of the wireless telegraph and did not even take the trouble to put into cipher his dispatches of which the eiffel tower made a careful collection in the evening of september seventh he said an officer of the intelligence corps brought me a dispatch from this same marwitz couched in something like these terms tell me exactly where you are and what you are doing hurry up because x x x the officer was greatly embarrassed to interpret those three x's adopting the language of the poilu i said to him translate it i am going to bolt true enough next day we found on the site of the german batteries which had been precipitously evacuated stacks of munitions while by the roadside we came upon motors abandoned for the slightest breakdown and near betts almost the entire outfit of a field bakery with a great store of flour and dough half kneaded paris and france were saved von kluck could not get over his astonishment he has tried to explain it by saying he was unlucky for out of a hundred governors not one would have attacked as galigny did throwing his whole available force nearly forty miles from his stronghold it was downright imprudence End of chapter seven